Hello, History 17B, rapidly becoming no longer autumn quarter 2023. So probably those of you watching this are my diehard folks. Probably the most iconic image of the Great Depression is Migrant Mother taken in Nipomo, California by photographer Dorothea Lang in 1936. It was first published in 11 March 1936 issue of the San Francisco News. Dorothea Lang was a photographer working for the Resettlement Administration, or RA, a Depression-era government agency formed to raise public awareness of and provide aid for struggling farmers. In 1936, while driving through California, Lang drove past a sign reading, Pea Pickers Camp. Lang literally drove past the camp and on for 20 miles before she felt that she had to turn back. In the camp, she found Florence Owens Thompson, the woman in the center of the photo, holding two of her children. She was 32 at the time the picture was taken. And Lang reported, she said that they had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding field and birds that the children killed. We sometimes hear that the Wall Street panic and crash of 1929 led to the Great Depression. While this makes a certain amount of sense, I find that it leaves me with a disjointed picture that separates out what are deeply intertwined strands. These strands were part of the flow leading not just to the Great Depression in the U.S., but to World War II in Europe as well. Different ideas about the role of governments in providing a safety net for their citizens and the disparity we see between, say, the National Health Service or NHS in countries like England and the structure of American health care in the U.S. started to take recognizable shape in this era. I like this front page from 24 October 1929 because it puts the stock market crash into the context of other news as part of a complicated whole. I will just read the headlines here. Wall Street in panic as stocks crash. Stocks crash in rush to sell. Billions lost. Attempt made to kill Italy's crown prince. Assassin caught in Brussels mob, Prince unhurt. Hollywood fire destroys films worth millions. Fear 52 perished in Lake Michigan, Ferry is missing. Piece of plain like Dietmann's is found at sea. High duty group gave $700,000 to Coolidge Dry. Carnegie charge of paid athletes rouses colleges. Hoover's train halted by auto placed on rails. Warder sought to keep sea trip secret. Summers named as head of the new whatever. What I am going to try to do in this lecture is tie the situation on the left here, what we just looked at in the newspaper in 1929, to both of the situations on the right in the mid to late 1930s, with the idea that the two on the right, the situation within the U.S. represented by migrant mother, and the global situation, including the U.S., represented by a map of Europe in disarray, are part and parcel of the same story, not two distinct stories of the 1930s even if the situation on the lower image would not directly affect most Americans until the 1940s. Please do not interpret what I'm presenting as a straight line cause and effect. It is difficult to tell a story in three dimensions or four dimensions if we include time. Simple linear thinking would suggest that without the Wall Street crash, somehow the Great Depression and World War II could have been averted. We do not and cannot know that. But if avoiding disaster were as simple as pulling the plug on one event, the world would be much less complicated and much less of a mess than we all know that it is now. Incidentally, in the image, the globe on the left is a tin for chocolates made in Germany in the 1920s, maybe the early 1930s. I'm going to start global in this lecture here, then zoom down to the U.S. to the ordinary person level. In the next lecture, we will look at American political response to this nexus of emerging catastrophes.
we have been looking at how the U.S. economy grew, not just in tandem with or next to the British economy, but interwoven with it. We've also seen that while the U.S. went into World War I as a debtor nation, meaning it owed money to foreign bodies, by the end of World War I, the U.S. had become a massive creditor nation, supplying money that kept European economies functioning. I haven't gone into the specific financial settlements at the end of World War I, and you only need a general picture at this juncture to get a basic idea of where things would go in the 1930s. Just focusing on Europe for now, leaving Asia, Turkey, and the Middle East to one side for the time being, countries like France, Belgium, and Germany were pretty well leveled during World War I, as you can see on the slide. Germany had been both an aggressor and on the losing side of the war. So the allied nations of Europe were bitter, to say the least. The allied nations that had been flattened didn't have the means to rebuild. And since they rather reasonably put the blame for damage on Germany, they also required Germany to pick up part of the tab for repairs. So the treaty that ended World War I required Germany to pay what are called reparations to the European allied nations. One major problem with this was that Germany had been leveled as well. The country didn't even have enough to rebuild on their own, much less to fund other war-damaged countries. So Germany had to borrow money to pay the reparations, and the U.S. was the global lender at the time. Meanwhile, the Allies had been borrowing money from the U.S. throughout World War I, as we've seen it. So money from European allies was gradually being paid back to the U.S. We end up with something that looks rather like this triangle here. Between 1924 and 1930, the international financial system, $2.6 in war payment debts was making its way from the Allied nations to the U.S. $2.5 billion in loans was making its way from the U.S. to Germany. $2.0 billion in reparation payments was being paid to the Allies, who were then paying back the U.S., who were then lending to Germany, who then, yeah. As long as the U.S. kept humming along, this was reasonably sustainable. But in late 1929, the U.S. stopped humming. The word crash indicates something quite abrupt, but abrupt is a relative thing. In late October, there were five days over which the stock market crash of 1929 took full shape in the U.S. And in the scheme of years, five days is acutely abrupt, as you can see on the chart on the slide. But at the same time, it was not clear to people on the ground how long the crash would last or what it would lead to. This slide shows the economy of the U.S. on the top there in that kind of lighter blue relative to four countries in Europe. The pale blue highlighting is the 1920s, and the right edge of that is 1929 stock market crash. The economy of France dropped off pretty much right away. Germany and the Netherlands chugged on briefly before sinking. Italy stayed fairly stable in the 1930s, but was the lowest of the economies shown. Looking ahead, you can see that all of Europe will get clobbered by the Second World War. But we are still in the 1930s in this lecture, and these people didn't know this was going to happen. Between 1929 and 1931, the U.S. responded to its stock market crash in two major ways that would hit the rest of the world hard. First, U.S. banks requested immediate repayment of loans to cover stock market losses. This led to a domino effect across Europe as bank after bank failed. The people on the right in the image are trying to get their savings out of a bank before it all goes in loan repayment and the bank folds. That picture was taken in Germany, but this was the scene across much of Europe. The chart on the left is deposits made into banks. And you can see that these plummet right away after 1929. The possible exception, the UK hung on there a little bit. No one wanted to trust 
what money they had to banks that seemed to be bottomless pits where money disappeared for good. Everyone, including U.S. banks, wanted to take money from European banks, and nothing was going back in. The second response of the U.S. government to the crash was to try to support American industry with a massive protective tariff. As the European economies crashed and credit disappeared, the market for U.S. exports also disappeared. In 1929, U.S. exports had hit $5.4 billion dollars. By 1933, they had dropped to less than half of that, with a total value of only $2.1 billion. To protect U.S. manufacturing at home from foreign competition, the U.S. Congress passed the Hawley Smoot Tariff, the highest taxes on imported goods in U.S. history. Of course, that pretty much cut off all cash flow to Europe, causing more banks and industries there to collapse. In return, countries in Europe set their own protectionist tariffs. In Germany, the tax rate on imports was 50%. Global trade took a massive hit, declining by 62%, and any efforts at a collaborative solution across countries failed miserably. Latin American exports of sugar, coffee, wool, copper, tin, silver, and petroleum came to a screeching halt. As U.S. banks failed, projects started by American corporations such as Ford and United Fruit Company no longer had access to funding. Already unstable economies and governments in Latin America were vulnerable to take over by militants and populists. You can see some of these political fluctuations already in 1930 on the map here, and it highlights the Wall Street crash of 1929 in the upper right. U.S. automakers stopped importing rubber for tires, and the rubber industry in Malaysia, Indochina, and the Dutch East Indies collapsed. After Holly Smoot, Japanese exports dropped by 50%. In retaliation for the curtailment of the silk trade, Japan prohibited the importation of rice. High protective tariffs cut off more and more imports for Japan. The influence of military extremists in Japan grew along with the desperation to acquire raw materials. In 1931, Japan invaded and occupied Manchuria, a region rich in resources and home to 30 million people. China, already weakened by a civil war between nationalists and communists, was not able to repulse Japan. Last time we looked at Russia, they were embroiled in civil wars following the Russian Revolution. In the 1920s, the country had stabilized under the Communist Party to become the Soviet Union, or USSR, which stands for Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Of course, that's the name in English. That's not the name in Russian. So the abbreviation there is CCCP, and I won't even try to read the Cyrillic alphabet. When you transliterate this to Latin script, which is what we use in the U.S., then it becomes the SSSR. So you can know that all of these things are the same thing, Soviet Union here. Soviet comes from a Russian word basically meaning a governing council. And Soviet Russia continued the imperialism of its predecessor, but now by collecting so-called Soviet republics into the fold. You can just see under Soviet Union that the biggest member is the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Below that, the Tajik Soviet Socialist Republic, or SSR, was formed in 1929. You can see other SSRs like Uzbek, Turkmen, and Ukraine have already formed by the end of the 1920s. Lenin, who led the newly consolidated Soviet Union, died in 1924. After his death, Joseph Stalin took command. 
Stalin was a sort of strongman dictatorial leader that we are about to see rising around Europe. If you remember back to the European political thought that we touched on at the beginning of the 20th century, Stalin's Soviet Union was top down, not truly communist at all. Stalin oversaw a period of rapid industrialization with zero concern for the consequences to ordinary citizens. The focus was completely on production goals. In the winter, just one winter, mind you, of 1932 to 33, an estimated 7 million peasants starved to death just in the Ukraine. This is one of those cases where I think photos can make something like 7 million people starving to the point of death in one winter Something that we can at least start to get our heads around. I did not choose the most graphic photos available, but in the picture on the upper right, the man on the ground is dead. He just dropped where he stood. If you are interested in looking up this bit of history more, you can search Holodomor. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it literally means hunger death, and you can find a lot of information on it. One relevance of the great worldwide depression to the Soviet republics was that it demonstrated a failing or shortcoming of capitalism. Just as later Stalin's purges or mass killings would allow the U.S. and allies to cast all communism as dictatorship, the Great Depression allowed the strongman leaders of Europe to claim a complete failure of capitalism. I chose this propaganda poster because the symbolism of Stalin steering the literal ship of state is exactly what we saw in a cartoon of Woodrow Wilson before World War I that I showed in a previous lecture. We don't actually need to read the Russian text to understand the message here. That said, I did have recourse to Google Translate, which glossed the text as, the captain of the country of the Soviets leads us from victory to victory. Italy had also come under an authoritarian dictator by 1929. In this case, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini's brand of dictatorship was called fascism. This can be linked to the modern Italian fascio or fascio for a group or bundle or to the classical Roman fasces with the same meaning. The fasces here on the right became a symbol of ancient Rome. The handle of the axe was made of a bundle of sticks with the idea that while one stick alone might break, when gathered together, the bundle is strong. The axe at the top indicates the supreme power of the ruler, including to the point of life and death over their subjects. When it came to Mussolini's fascism and the economy, it was a capitalist economy, but it was not free. Mussolini protected capitalists from annoying things like strikes with total state power over the economy as well as the population. As with Stalin pointing out that the free market capitalist just got slammed by the market crash and Great Depression made for good told you so propaganda. The idea that a global catastrophe meant a failure of capitalist governments was widespread. Agreement about what it should be replaced with was not. Some countries in Europe had parliamentary democracies. For now, just think about them as closer to U.S. style government than to the other forms of government we've just been looking at. They had multiple elected politicians who argued and debated to work out policy. And many of these in the 1930s, the left and the right became increasingly distanced from one another, leaving governments unable to form enough of a consensus to do anything, and elected leaders unable to form stable governments. You are looking at a riot in France and Paris. In the five-year period between 1931 and 1936, France had 10 different premiers who formed 12 different governments, one of which 
only lasted one week. Germany started off with the Weimar Republic after World War I. This never really stabilized, but it did have elected officials until 1933 when Hitler's Nazi party seized power. I won't even attempt the German down here, but the official name of the Nazi party was the National Socialist German Workers Party party. You can see it. This is where you see many Americans on the right equate Nazism with socialism. Hitler controlled the economy and individuals within the state by glorifying militarism and white nationalism. His government was a totalitarian dictatorship. On the other hand, a Volkswagen was formed under the Nazis as an affordable mass-produced car for the white German people, or Volk. Volkswagen literally means the people's car. As European countries went, Britain was a bastion of political stability as long as you don't consider Ireland. Nonetheless, as banks and industries closed as a result of paralyzed trade and financial failure, unemployment soared in the UK for to 22%. For comparison, Germany's unemployment rate would go up to 30%. Britain's weekly paper, The Economist, blamed the Holly Smoot tariff for turning a stock market collapse into a crippling decade-long depression. Now, Holly Smoot could not single-handedly have caused all of the political unrest around the globe that we have just been considering. But it certainly didn't help either. It didn't help much at home in the U.S. as well. You can see on the chart here that the unemployment rate in the U.S. in 1932 was 25%. It was not just overall unemployment that made the Holly Smoot, or as you'll see it sometimes like in this left-hand cartoon here, the Smoot Holly. It's not just unemployment that made that tariff unpopular in the U.S. The perception, and probably not too far off the mark, was that the tariff protected some industries but left American farmers out of luck. In the comic on the left, Industry carries off the smoot holly pig, while agriculture is left with just the tail. In the right, holly smoot is a ravenous donkey whose teeth say high tariff on what the farmer buys, while corporate America, labeled Congress over here, by the way, stands back comfortably with no animal of its own to feed. And that, of course, brings us to the effect that not just the tariff, but the big picture issue of a massive stock market crash, followed by an extended economic depression, had on folks in America where all of this was also accompanied by the worst ecological disaster that the U.S. had seen up to that point. You may have noticed that while I have been defining political economic theories as we've gone along, things like socialism, syndicalism, communism, totalitarianism, fascism, I have not defined capitalism. This is the big moment. A basic definition of capitalism reads, capitalism is an economic system based on the private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit. Central characteristics of capitalism include capital accumulation, competitive markets, price systems, private property, property rights recognition, voluntary exchange, and wage labor. Out of that definition, I think that most of us have a handle on things like profit, wage labor, property, markets, production, prices. I find that when people start to say, hmm, it's on the word that is actually central to the word capitalism. What does capital mean in this context? Here are a set of definitions for capital I found while cruising the internet. The assets, physical tools, plants, and equipment that allow for increased work produ productivity. Assets which can be liquidated to get cash or cash equivalents. Liquid assets, physical or financial resources used to produce value in an economy. 
this one I just love, anything that brings our ideas and abilities to fruition and enables us to produce goods and services more efficiently. If you have any television streaming services, you might question that. An investment, another definition of capital, an investment either in the form of money or machinery and equipment that is used to produce goods and services. And last one, a stock of resources that may be employed in the production of goods and services. I am going to gloss all of that, all of those definitions as capital is whatever you need to make money. In order to make money, you need capital. And in order to get capital, you need money. You cannot start a business without money and capital. I took this image from someone who had done the work for me, someone who is more savvy than I am about money. Fortunately, they put their mark on the image, which makes it easy for me to give them credit. This image explains how stocks work. Companies issue stocks to raise capital in an initial public offering. Stockholders sell their shares on the stock market. Members of the public and investors buy and sell these shares. Stocks are bought and sold based on expectations or predictions of corporate earnings. Shareholders can make a return on their investment by selling shares at a higher price than purchased, receiving dividends and through derivatives. This makes some sense if you have a very, very small group. I have already made hardcore economists run screaming with my last slide. So if there are any left in the room, you know what to do. As far as I am concerned, capitalism is highbrow legal gambling that makes money for people who have money and who can spend most of their time working the system. Clearly, none of that describes me. Unfortunately, in the 1920s, many people who played the stock market also did not understand the system. Or more to the point, they didn't pay enough attention to what was going on for the people around them to see the handwriting on the wall. A stock market crash is a sudden plunge in stock prices that is made worse by panic and more selling. The stock market crash of 1929 was not inevitable, but it did follow logically from a sequence of events that folks who lived on the stock market could have seen happening around them. In aviation, there is something called a graveyard spiral, and that is an accidental high rate of descent tight banked turn, which if not corrected ends in structural failure or an almost certainly fatal high-speed impact with ground. Picture that as I describe the 1920s for farmers here. Farmers had done what economists call overproduced, which I find an annoying term from the perspective of those who do the actual producing. The demand for agricultural products grew during World War I, especially, although not only for American farmers. When the war ended, farmers, not being elite economists for the most part, did what they had been doing and kept producing. But demand dropped, which meant that the prices farmers could realize for their goods dropped as well. In desperation, they tried to produce more to earn more money, which only drove prices down further. Farmers, like most people we have seen in the 1920s, bought on credit. But here it wasn't electrical gadgets. It was the seed and the tools and the machinery and the land they needed to do the farming that made them farmers. As farmers realized lower and lower and into the negative returns on their products, they defaulted on their bank loans and had to leave their farms as banks they owed foreclosed on them. Banks got the farms, which were worth money, but not if no one could afford to buy them, putting banks in a position to call in more loans, leading to more defaults and an economic death spiral. Meanwhile, production of consumer goods soared in the 1920s, as we've seen. But the wages of the workers who produced them 
did not. Does that sound at all familiar? The working class could not afford the products that they made, and the middle class could only buy so much. Consumer goods stockpiled as demand dropped, and the industrial graveyard spiral that you see on the slide here became more and more dangerous for the economic pilots. On 24 October 1929, a massive sell-off began at the New York Stock Exchange. Brokers were willing to sell millions of shares for lower and lower prices because they figured they were only going to get worse. At the end of the day, 25 Wall Street brokerages tried to stop the tide of disaster by announcing that the worst had passed. Investors were not convinced, and the next day, the sell-off only got worse. Investors panicked and pretty much dumped their stocks for any price, no matter how low. Brokers, like everyone else in the 1920s, bought on credit. In this case, they borrowed the money that they used to buy or gamble on stocks. This is called buying on the margin. In a spiral pattern now familiar to us, creditors called in loans that brokers could not pay. So brokers desperately sold what they had or whatever they could get. On Tuesday, 29 October, 3 million shares were sold in the first 30 minutes of trading. The value of leading industrial stocks declined by something like 40%. Stock losses for October 1929 totaled in the neighborhood of $50 billion, which, according to some calculations, exceeds the total amount that the U.S. spent on World War I. But here's the thing. Most Americans did not own stock. They did not have the money necessary to make more money. And so in the first year after the crash, they were feeling the bite of the agricultural and industrial graveyard spirals we looked at, but not so much the stock market spiral. You can see that little lag before unemployment starts to skyrocket in the graph on the slide. And you can see that by 1933, about a quarter of the American workforce was unemployed. As the value of stocks went increasingly lower in the death spiral, businesses began to fail, putting employees out of work. In an effort to stay afloat, some businesses proactively laid off some workers. Workers cut back on purchasing if they still had anything to spend at all. Remember, banks were desperately calling in loans that farmers and the working class simply could not pay off. The whole point of purchasing on credit to begin with being that they did not have large sums of money. By the early 1930s, expressed as a number rather than a percent, 14 one four million Americans were out of work. A further 40 for 0 million out of a total population of 123 million earned some money, but not enough to survive. Taken on average between 1929 and 1932, American families lost about a third of their incomes. And of course, we know that this loss was not averaged out. It was not evenly distributed. A survey of American urban areas showed that the unemployment rate among Black Americans reached 50%, 5 0. And in the South, it was quite likely worse. Added on to all that, from 1930 to 1936, the US saw the greatest ecological disaster known up to that time the Dust Bowl. I will explain more in a moment, but briefly, the dust in the Dust Bowl, high winds literally stripped topsoil completely from cultivated regions of the plains and deposited that soil on homes and farms, burying entire towns and destroying livelihoods. I have given you the intro and first chapter of Donald Wooster's Dust Bowl, 
although the copy is terrible and the quarter is winding down, so I suggest looking it up in a library if you're interested. In the intro, Wooster connects capitalism directly to the monumental ecological disaster of the Dust Bowl. He says, quote, the Dust Bowl represented the outcome of a culture that deliberately, self-consciously set itself that task of dominating and exploiting the land for all it was worth. There is no way to attach a neat, simple meaning to a ph phenomenon as large and changeable as capitalism, but it maintains an enduring ethos that gives the economic culture continuity. The use of land in this culture abides by ecological values taught by the capitalist ethos. And these are, as explained by Worcester, nature must be seen as capital. Man has a right to use this capital for constant self-advancement. The social order should permit and encourage this continual increase of personal wealth. On that last point, Wooster elaborates, idealized capitalism should free individuals, and we know from our 14th Amendment lecture, corporations as collective individuals, from encumbrances on their aggressive use of nature, and protect the successful from losing what they have gained. In pure capitalism, the self as an economic being is not only all-important, but autonomous and irresponsible. The community exists to help individuals get ahead and to absorb the environmental costs. The picture that you see on the right there is an approaching dust storm in the Middle West. And I put a series of pictures in a moment because to me, this is, this is just inconceivable. The standard story we hear about the Dust Bowl is that farmers did not understand how to work the land of the plains, mismanaged it, and ended up with this disaster. While true, that way of looking at it sort of makes it feel like the farmers brought this on themselves. I would like to take a step back and remind you that the small farmers were the ones who absorbed the environmental costs here, not the ones who practiced successful capitalism. You have seen both of these ads before. Railroads given free land by the government sold that land with false promises about how the land could be used. Although some farmers took advantage of the Homestead Act, many were forced to buy from land speculators who had enough money to buy land outright in huge swaths and then sell it off bit by bit for massive profits, again with promises that the land was suitable for farming, presumably using techniques that farmers already knew. So you can see the railroad is selling land, it says products will pay for land and improvements. This whole deal with improvements, you might remember from the Closing the Gap lecture and around there. And the one from the speculator says 12 million acres of the best farming lands in America. Then in the 1920s, farmers could not actually make a living at all without farm machinery, and they could not buy that machinery outright, so they took out loans. Then with the crash and international repercussions, banks started calling in loans that farmers could not pay, or banks failed outright taking savings with them. When farmers could not repay loans, banks foreclosed, meaning they took everything that the farmer had and auctioned it off to pay the loan. Sometimes farmers auctioned everything themselves to try to pay the bank. All of this was bad enough, but then came this dust storm, inconceivably huge dust storm looming over houses and vehicles. And this left farms looking like this. In this image, the dirt is literally up to the roof and slightly over it of a farm. So I will be talking about farming practices that contributed to the Dust Bowl, but we are not going to hold farmers solely responsible, but consider them part of the community that exists to help individuals get ahead and to absorb the environmental costs. Over nearly the entire decade of the 1930s, 
the southwestern Great Plains region of the United States suffered a severe drought. The region had already been semi-arid grassland or treeless plains when we saw the railroad go through and thousands of settlers arrive after Congress passed the Railroad and Homestead Acts of 1862. Interstates like Route 66 that we saw being built a few lectures ago opened up new spaces to farm since produce could be more easily shipped or trucked, really. Most settlers farmed their land or grazed cattle. Farming required plowing the prairie grasses and planting dryland wheat. This led to the systematic destruction of the prairie grasses. In the ranching regions, overgrazing also destroyed large areas of grassland, and it was the prairie grasses that had held moisture in the soil and that had kept the soil in place. Gradually, the land was laid bare, and soil erosion began even before the drought and the high winds. With the onset of drought in 1930, the overfarmed and overgrazed land literally began to blow away. Winds whipping across the plains, raising unbelievably huge clouds of dust. And I really encourage you, if you just listen to these, to at least look up some Dust Bowl pictures because the dust storms are inconceivably huge. The sky could darken for days, and even well-sealed homes formed thick layers of dirt inside. In some places, the dust drifted like snow, covering farm buildings and houses. Nineteen states in the heartland of the United States became a vast bowl of dust. With no chance of making a living, Farm families abandoned their homes and land, even if they still owned them, and fled westward to become migrant laborers. You may recognize the woman in this photo over here on the right as the same one as in the iconic depression photo that I showed at the beginning of the lecture. This is not her entire family. I believe that she had seven children and you only see four here. But what you see in the picture frame is everything that the family had in the world. Key points for Lecture 17. The stock market crash of 1929, the Great Depression, and major political unrest within and among European powers emerged from the complicated interweaving of imperialism and capitalism that we have seen taking shape throughout these lectures. The U.S. emerged from World War I as a creditor nation, having lent billions to European nations during the war, particularly to the Allied powers. Once World War I ended, these nations began to make payments on their loans to the U.S. The Allied nations of Western Europe, particularly Belgium and France, took heavy damages during World War I. They were faced with trying to rebuild while starting to repay the loans to the U.S., they were also incredibly angry with Germany. The peace treaty that concluded World War I required Germany to pay reparations to the deeply damaged Allied nations. Germany had also been flattened by World War I and was faced with both rebuilding and paying reparations to countries it had invaded. In order to do this, Germany had to borrow money from the U.S., this cycling of money through the U.S. and Europe worked until the U.S. economy faltered. The stock market crash of 1929, followed by the Hoover government's Holly Smoot tariff, which set unprecedented taxes on imported goods, exacerbated already unstable political situations across Europe, as well as the rest of the globe. Banks in both the U.S. and abroad started to call in loans from every level, individual to nation, so that they could cover their stock market losses. Meanwhile, in a panic, people rushed to extract their money from banks before that money disappeared. Bank after bank failed. Within the U.S., businesses either shut down completely or laid off workers to try to cut costs and stay afloat. Unemployment skyrocketed 
even as the unemployed or marginally employed were being asked to pay back bank loans. These people saw their homes, belongings, farms, literally everything they had in the world repossessed by banks. Beginning in 1930, a decade-long drought combined with high winds and soil eroded by over-farming to produce the worst ecological disaster known to the U.S. up to that point. In the Dust Bowl, winds lifted massive clouds of topsoil from regions of the Great Plains only to drop it in other regions, burying farms and towns. With nothing, absolutely nothing left to live on, Midwestern farmers started migrating west in large numbers hoping to find food and work. The photographer who took the images from the Nopomo, California migrant camp that I used to start and end lecture was Dorothea Lang. Born just at the end of the 1800s, the name Lang was actually her mother's maiden name, which Dorothea took as her legal name in adulthood. She studied and apprenticed in photography in New York City and then ended up in San Francisco by 1919. Prior to the Great Depression, Dorothea Lang worked as a portrait photographer. So she started out in 1919, Great Depression hit in 1929, so she was fairly well established by the time the Depression hit. Dorothea Lang was successful as a portrait photographer in San Francisco until the stock market crashed in 1929. As her business diminished with the Depression, she began photographing the world around her, starting with what she could see from the window of her portrait studio. From that vantage point, Lang observed the aimless, jobless men that haunted San Francisco during the Great Depression, and she left the studio to photograph these people. Lang's photographs captured issues that initially did not get broad coverage, issues that were highly politically charged. Lang ended up dedicating pretty much the rest of her career and her life to subjects who faced danger and existential uncertainty as a daily fact of life. One of the early photos became famous as White Angel Breadline that you see on the slide and was taken close to her studio where a woman known as the White Angel had set up a stand in an attempt to feed the legions of unemployed. By exposing the injustice and abuse that she witnessed, Lang hoped to motivate those with power to do so to mitigate their suffering. Not unlike Jacob Rees, his photographs of New York tenements we saw several lectures ago. Lang covered efforts of ordinary folks to help one another, such as the image on the left here. The Unemployed Exchange Association, or UXA, you see that on their banner, was a self-help cooperative formed in the early days of the Depression to provide work for unemployed men. Lang also covered politically unpopular labor strikes and protests, including a labor rally on May Day of 1934 in San Francisco. And I've given you three pictures from that. Lang found work with a series of relief organizations, significantly, as I said in the main lecture, the Resettlement Agency, later called the Farm Security Administration, for whom she was working when she took the iconic migrant mother picture. Lang also produced photos for the WPA, which we'll get to next lecture. Both of the photographs taken here were taken in the early 1930s in San Francisco. These three images on the slide now are all from 1938. In the late 1930s, Lang headed across the U.S., photographing people who had not escaped the Dust Bowl and made it to California. The woman in the middle photographed in the Texas panhandle in June, Lang quoted as saying, we've had no work since March. The worst thing we did was when we sold the car, but we had to sell it to eat. And now we can't get away from here. This country's a hard country. They won't help bury you here. If you die, you're dead. That's all. 
As we know from lecture, entire families were escaping drought and dust storms in the Midwest, many looking for work in California. One of Lang's first road trips was undertaken for the state of California before she was picked up by the federal government. Lang photographed migrant families jammed into old cars, or as many were forced to do, traveling on foot. She captured the harsh realities of life on the road and shattered the notions that Okies, the derogatory term for these agricultural refugees, were lazy and dangerous. Lang's work helped create sympathy for migrants among many, although by no means all, Americans. And you can picture, here's, there's a truck. Bindle stiffs were migrant single men He's walking through Arizona to California, as is this family who are still in Oklahoma. Lang sometimes showed the disconnect between reality and the world of advertising that had developed in the 1920s. So we talked about in the 1920s, the highways and the billboards by the highways. These people are camped out in the shade of a billboard because it is the only shade. And what you see is what they have. And these two men are walking, says, toward Los Angeles, California. It doesn't say exactly where they are. And they were walking past a billboard that says, next time, try the train. Relax. Lang was really only paid to record American citizens as seen by the 1938 map on the slide on the right. But she photographed what she saw, even if it wasn't strictly according to the brief. So you see untitled on the left, a child of migrants from Mexico taken around 1935. I have barely touched the surface of Lang's photography, and I plan to do another coda on her work during World War II when we get there in lectures. But in case I don't succeed, you should look her up yourself if you're interested. A number of museums have done Dorothea Lang retrospectives and make these available online. The largest collection of Lang's photos along with items like her papers and letters, live in the Oakland Museum of California, should you wish to pursue the topic more deeply in person. 